pleasure to be able to introduce Lynn Arnold because I've known her for years, several years, and uh, she is one of the Central Atlantic region seven states presidents. And um, it's very exciting to have her on here. I've heard her talk about this program and I'm looking forward to it. But also to give you just a look, maybe Lynn will be telling about advances but she does have um, the conferences in New York next year, 2023. So with that, I'll say, um, Lynn, um, it's a pleasure to turn the program over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Betty. Yes, I'm the president of the Federated Garden Clubs in New York State. We're one of the largest states in our seven sister states of CAR. We have about 6,000 members and 124 clubs. And we had just recently had a wonderful conference of convention and a symposium. We had 88 people attend our symposium also from New York as well as from out of state. I'm going to um, pull up my square share screen and uh, so that we can uh, go. And screen sharing. It's hard to get the uh, top of the to release to go up. I just sneak it in here. Okay, let's do it. <clears throat> There you go. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Can you still see the black band on the top? Yes. Yeah. Uh, no, we see the heading of uh, your slide. Okay. How's this black? Yeah, but it's not moving. The, um, it's not moving up. There you go. Okay. So now what? You don't see the black heading on top, right? Just the top of my slide. Okay. We're all good. We're all good. All good, Lynn. The bottom left corner is your advanced spot. Okay. All right. So <clears throat> many years ago, like 20 years ago, when um, I first started going to that, when I first started going to the New York State board meetings, there was a lady called Jane Friedman. Jane Friedman from Long Island. And she was coming to talk about the Nature Conservancy. And she'd come bouncing down the aisle between the, the seated board members with a one foot wide butterfly. And she'd bounce down, I could barely see her. She was a tiny little woman. And she would bounce down the, the, the aisle and get to the podium at the end and talk about the Albany pine bush. And I, I was so impressed by her excitement and her blue butterfly. I said, one day I'm going to get to the Albany pine bush. I'm gonna find out just exactly what it looks like and what goes on there. So I made this program for a convention that we had and it was taking place in New York near the pine bush. And I came up with this title on Albany dunes. Nobody's ever used that title before. Just to give you a little inkling, it's this really sandy area we're talking about. The Albany Pine Bush Preserve is a unique ecosystem called unique by uh, <clears throat> the state of New York because of its sand dunes. We have the Lysades Mycillus Carna Blue Butterfly and Lupinus Perennis Wild Blue Lupin, which is its host plant. I said, okay, I'm gonna do this talk. What am I gonna do? I'm gonna Google it. What am I gonna find out? about to Google. Now I'm not getting my, I'm not moving the slide. <laughs> oh, my computer is not moving the slides. I know somebody mentioned the lower left-hand corner. Let's see. Okay, so there wasn't much. There wasn't much online about the Carna Blue Butterfly or the Albany Pine Bush, but there was this article, a New York Times article written by Middlebach and Cruden. You can see their names there. Chasing Nabokov's elusive and endangered true love. Turns out that Vladimir Nabokov, the author that wrote Lolita and Prim, is a lepidopterist. And he studied at Harvard in 1940. 
and found some little tiny blue butterflies in the 19th century. And finally in 1950, he went to Corner, New York and he did see the Corner Blue Butterfly there. And he's the one who named it, the Lysades, Melissa Samuelis. We know it as the Corner Blue Butterfly. Well, there is a handbook. The last book that was ever written was in the 1970s about the Albany pine bush and that's out of print. But this lovely new book is there at the pine bush available at the education center in the gift shop. And it's got a patent, patent leather blue cover and it has a picture of the blue tree frog on it. And it has a um, picture of the corner blue butterfly. And inside it talks about the many species that are members of the pitch pine scrub oak community. These, this community uh, favors sandy soils and arid habitats. This is one of the Helianthus divericatus is what woodland sunflower is one of those that favor that arid habitat. And many of these species have a special adaptation that allow them to survive fire. I've never used this way of moving slides before. Let's see. Okay, so on this map, I love maps, <laughs> stuck it in there. You see the boundaries. Everything that's shaded is the Albany pine bush. So you have Albany to the east, Schenectady to the west. In the north, you have Route 20, <clears throat> and, and um, the south, you have uh, Route 5. And here uh, with the star is where the education center is. And that's off this main thoroughfare, Washington Avenue extension. Twenty thousand years ago, in the Wasconian period, the last glacier reached Long Island. They are leaving Long Island as a glacial moraine. The ice was one thick, one mile thick over the national capital area, and the ice melted, and it retreated, and it created an ice dam here. And where it was blocked, the water accumulated and meltwater accumulated and created Glacial Lake Albany. And here at the bottom, <clears throat> at the top of Glacial Lake Albany is Glens Falls and Lake George area. And on the very south of Glacial Lake Albany is Newburgh where I live. And I have a friend, Pat Wani, as some of you may have known her, former president of the Federated Garden Clubs in New York State. She lives up here. And I live here in Newburgh. We actually are neighbors, although it takes two and a half hours to get <laughs> by car to get from here to there. You can see what a large lake it was. <clears throat> As the glacier receded all the way up from Long Island, all the way up, it, it ground and receded and scraped the bread rock, grinding it boulders and stones to sand and clay. Several, several rivers here, you can see the Mohawk River um, emptied there into Lake Glacier, Lake Glacier, um, Glacial Lake Albany. Large amounts of sand and gravel were deposited to the lake shore, forming a delta. The sandy delta that underlies what today is known as the Albany pine bush. There it was scraped and sculptured into sand dunes. And then 10,000 years ago, a succession of plants, fauna species shaped by well-drained soils and periodic fires populated the pine bush. This area once that was 25,000 acres is down to 6,000 acres. And in 1988, the New York State legislated a commission. And who's on this commission? the commissioner of environmental Cons conservation and the commissioner of parks and recs and the mayor of the city of Albany and supervisors Colony and Gilderland and the CEO of the county of Albany and director of nature conservancy and four other people that are appointed by the governor. If we'd ever figure out the governor of New York, maybe I would get appointed. These partners listed here and there's others besides 
the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation, Forest Service, Park Service, Conservancy, and Wildlife Service. These are the people that get together every year to do a prescribed burn so that they can do it watched carefully and it won't spread. And this, is, this is what an area looks like after one of those burns. So all that's left is the pitch pine and the scrub oaks, but all of that understory perennials and all and weeds and weedy trees and non-natives and even aggressive natives all get burnt out. And what it does is it allows the seed coats of the Lupinus perennis, the host plant for the for the Carna blue, to crack open. More on that. But let's get started on my tour. I was so excited. Just like when you're a kid and you say, I can't wait, we're going, we're going. Where are we going? Most likely the beach. Well, there it was, 18 degrees out, March, 2017. And my husband and I came, I thought they were gonna cancel the tour, but apparently they, they, they had the one naturalist was there. She stuffed her hands in her pockets. My husband stuffed his hands in his pockets and off we went. We walked up to the trailhead, stepped out onto the trail and I was so excited. Excited, we said, it's a beach. I was standing on soil. I was standing on sand, not a soil path, but a sandy path. And you can see it here. This um, sandy path was worked over 10,000 years ago, but it left sand about five to 150 feet deep. It's yellow to brown, underneath light gray to fine to medium coarse. There's a sandy loam in the, in the uh, forested areas of about six and a half feet and gets a high water level of about three and a half feet. I walk along this beautiful path. I feel like I'm gonna walk out and see water. I see blue sky in the distance, but I know there's no water there now. Elnor beaches and pine bush have well-drained acid to neutral soil. The Stratford soil left by glacial lakes and meltwater are deep and poorly drained way below the sandy soil area. And any of the soils that are there are acid to slightly acid. And there are some boggy areas that are in the new areas of the preserve. Pitch pine and scrub oak occur in acidic soils. Along the path, there's some, some uh, of these educational pictures listed, um, a bit turn. I have only seen them on the Jersey shore or out in Cape Cod. I've never seen them in the middle of a forest, but with the vernal pools that we get in the spring because of the high water level that we get in this boggy area, you, the uh, bitterns will fly in from the river, from the Hudson River near Albany. This is a wading bird and in this particular picture, they're showing you how when he lifts up his chin, you can't see him. He's hidden with the cattails. There's 159 species of birds in the pine bush, like the towhee and the common yellow throat and the pine warbler and indigo bunting. There's mammals, there's the rare black bear, there's fox, both red and gray and 25 lepidopteral butterflies, amphibians and reptiles, there's 33 of those and 32 insects. So here's a picture of um, the pitch pine and scrub oak. And the scrub oak here in the front and, and pitch pine. T today, these areas, this land of the pine bush is imperiled by land development. And these pine barrens, which is another way that the people talk about this area, are anything but barren. These unusual ecosystems have a wealth of rare and endangered and threatened plants and animals. <clears throat> and uh, some of, of the uh, understory plants are, are huckleberries and cress. That this is what I saw along the way as I was walking there in both in March and in May. Um, there's blueberries and sweet fern. 
also in May. And here you see a picture of the Eastern Bracken, which is basically a fern on a stick. And anytime you see these brackens, you'll know you're in a wet area. As we reach the top of that trailhead, you'll see here a beautiful picture. I find it hauntingly beautiful in its severity. This was an evidence of an old burn, not the new one that we saw at the beginning of the slides, but here, this one would have been a couple of years because now the understory plants are beginning to create a, a little bit of vegetation. But the vegetation sitting on top of sand doesn't really grow heavy. It really, really in the, in the very um, hot summers and the cold winters blowing, winds blowing, it, it turns into a friable dust, which becomes very easy to burn. The, the pine barrens burn for every six to 15 years. And some species have uh, need that open savanna, the savanna-like area of little hills and dales. And it's in these little hills that the Lupinus perennis will bloom. Today, the pine barrens are warmer and dry, drier than the surrounding landscapes. In the summer, it reaches 102 degrees and goes down to minus eight in the winter. It's dry for the first quarter of where, where we were here in, in March. It was It's dry that first quarter of the year. And then it rains spring into summer. Um, and an interesting uh, note is that the Catskills and Adirondack Mountains are rain shadows that decrease the total precipitation in this particular area. Okay. So this is a, a picture that I took of a poster that was in the education building. And it gives you a cartoon version of this where it shows you your vernal pool here in the spring. Now you have your rain, you have your snow in the winter time. And then, the, and then this, I'm just waiting for the phone. Yeah, it's okay. I, I wanted to know if you were interested in that. I, I just wanted someone, if someone can mute, the, mute their phone and shout on, on the phone. Okay, good. So here's the vernal, vernal pond and you see the, the layer of sand and then you see how it's saturated water, that water table that rises creating these vernal pools, but then that left over from the glacier impermeable clay and silt. And then in May, when we went back, we were able to see the beautiful <clears throat> Lupinus perennis growing up those little hills and dales. The, um, there is biotic evidence that of a calcifile, which are lime loving plants. The wild lupin is a calcifile and it needs lime in the soil to thrive. Not an easy transplant. It occurs near other lime loving plants as the harebell and the Asclepias tuberosa, the butterfly weed. There's also boggy areas that have orchids and tway blades and fringe gentian in, in the lower areas. The, the Pinus rigida, the pitch pine is in bloom in this photograph lovely light brown coral colored new growth against the powder blue sky. There are 20 pitch pine sites worldwide. That's it, just 20. Five of those sites are in New York and without fires, the water areas would become red maple swamps with sumacs as well. And here's a field of lupin going up those little hills and dales. This is a, um, a number of slides, a few slides of those other plants that are blooming in the summertime. The Lysimachia, which also likes a water scythe, the world loose strife that also prefers water. That's Lysimachia is not, not the loose strife. Um, 
That's the invasive one, that's Salicaria. Quercus alicifolia, that's scrub oak. And you see little tiny acorns on their full size, almost a dwarf, and the leaves are full size, but the plant itself is short. The Rosa Carolina, which is the New York State flower. And this flower, this rose is growing practically in the dark. You can see how dark it is around it. It was really grown right in the middle of all those trees and bushes and things. Lily in Philadelphia come the wood lily. It's one of my favorite. It looks like a hand being raised up with the fingers up. I really enjoy that plant and always excited when I see it in the woods. We have here's another picture of it because I like it so much. As a member of the Vermont Botanical and Bird Club, I get to go out botanizing every year with that club. And I've been to other sites around the country to see wildflowers, but it's always fun to see the wood woodly. Now, this is a new one for me, um, Asclepius amplexicollis. This is the blunt leaf milkweed, and you can recognize it by this ribbon edge. It just flows and undulates in a ribbon. And it's about three and a half feet tall. It's not quite as tall as the common milkweed. Go through to Frosta virginiana. And again, I wanted um, to uh, talk a little bit again about the um, blue lupin um, and that fire can directly stimulate the release of, of the crack the seed and so that the water can get inside the seed for germination. Uh, it also would increase the water ab absorption. And this is um, a very impermeable seed coat. And the seeds can lay dormant, but they need that fire in order to crack them open. Um, <clears throat> this is a hardness is broken by heat. And the families of Fabiaceae and legume families other species like lupins and vetch need that. Uh, it's the lens coat. That's the part of the seed coat that lets water into germination. And it's underneath the leaves that the Melissa Samuelis Carna Blue but butterfly um, makes their seeds. I see. Else needs to mute. Finally, you get to see a picture of the Carna Blue butterfly. This was in July and the Carna Blue butterfly doesn't fly long. It doesn't fly long distances. And that's why it's unique to this area. It's not gonna go and fly to another state. It's gonna live here in this for a couple of days and lay their eggs underneath these leaves of the lupin. This is the lupin that it's sitting on. And, and it's been known to feed on other plants, um, a nectar on other plants, but it does lay its seeds underneath the, uh, the lupinus perennis. The wild lupin is a re relatively shade intolerant, long lived perennial. And the, it's part of the pea family, as I mentioned before, and it does have an obligate bacterial root association for nitrogen fixation. The mycorrhizae causes um, nodules to form on the roots and it's there where the nitrogen fixation takes place in those nodules that are formed by those mycorrhizae. And that, that um, will come up from the little wet areas and run up through the roots of these plants that, that require that nitrogen fixation. Was otherwise is really they, because of the burning, it doesn't get that that loam that a forest would have a buildup of nutrients. It has to get the nutrients just from that mycorrhizal nitrogen fixation, and it wants this open sunny area, which again is caused and created by the fires, um, and it's a disturbance oriented successional, which means after fire perennial, just like the fireweed in Alaska. Here's another field of lupins. Um, in addition to the pine bush, there's four other areas in New York that support the Carna Blue. 
Um, there's the rocky slopes of the Appalachian Plateau that includes Mohonk, Mohonk Mountain House in the Hudson Valley and in the Taconic Highlands. There's the Saratoga Sand Plain at the Wilton Wildflower Preserve, Wildlife Preserve, the Saratoga Airport and the Queensbury Sand Plain, and the Tonawanda Indian Reservation in Gen Genesee City. Some uh, other spring butterflies like the spring azure and the eastern tail blue um, here with its wings back are on the sumac along with the bumblebee. <clears throat> and some, and you, they, are, they are all small little tiny butterflies. And probably that's what you see because you're not gonna see the corner blue unless you go to one of these um, sand plains. Here's a picture of the corner blue. Um, puddling. Uh, the Carna Blue has two broods each year. The spring brood adults fly and in May, from May to, May to mid-June and then the summer brood comes in mid-July to early August. So this was the second brood picture that I was taking because I was there in, in July. <clears throat> Another picture of the uh, Carna Blue. Here you can see the top part and uh, you can see that it's a male um, and both the male and the females have these crescent shapes on the underside, but on top only the female has the crescents. The uh, first brood nectar and lay eggs on the lupins that go to seed by the time of the emergence of the second brood. The, then the second brood nectars on a variety of species, uh, butterfly weed, New Jersey tea and dotted horse mint. And uh, here's, a, here's a picture of the dotted horse mint, Monata punctata. At peak bloom, the uh, first brood hatch and the larvae are, are green larvae and they're attended by ants. And when I Googled, to find out some information about the Carna blue butterfly, as you, as you can see, there wasn't that much there. Um, the one of, I went to Google Scholar, which is another opportunity for you to find out more when you're doing research. And on Google Scholar, there was an article about how ants will take the eggs of the butterflies and bring them down underground when there's a fire. So that was amazing for me to read. Cause I'm thinking, how did they survive? I can understand that the seeds crack open in a fire, but how did the eggs of the second brood survive? And that's probably how. The ants take them down and bring them underground. But when they, when they are above ground and they do pupate, the ants do attend the larva. The larva is about two to three milliliters. The eggs are only one milliliter. And the butterflies are just one inch. They're really tiny. Now here's some lupin seed pods. And, and the, you can see the leaves are basil leaves. And it's there underneath basil leaves that the butterfly will deposit the seeds. <clears throat> they lay their eggs in those, under those dried seed pods and and closer to the ground, and they go dormant over winter. The eggs overwinter and hatch next May as the first brood. The adult corner blue are nectar feeders and they aid in the pollination of a variety of wildflowers like this Rudebeckia serotina. This is the male corner blue, you can see here. There's no crescents. The male corner blue emerged before the females and both sexes live four to five days, sometimes one to two weeks. And they do have some interesting um, technology now at the pine bush to count the butterflies and, and see how long they're living. And now they're, they're active from sunrise to sunset, but um, the, there's a decrease in activity in cool, windy, and rainy weather. So if you're looking to find the Carna Blue Butterfly, 
I wouldn't suggest going out in the rain <laughs> because they're going to stay and roost. They really, they, they are, um, do not prefer that kind of weather. So let's see, here's a picture of the Carna blue butterfly flying. I'll take it, I can do that again. And you see how it's flying over the sands of the sandy path where there may have been some water rain the night before. The male wings, as you look down top side, are a violet periwinkle blue with white edges. The corner blue is the most famous insect. Let's see. The corner blue is the most famous insect of the Albany pine bush. In Nabokov's Prim in 1957, a well-known passage depicts these butterflies as blue snowflakes flying above wet, floating, sorry, floating above wet sand. A Acres and areas of lupins grew where the sites of the office buildings of Albany legislature now stand. Also the buildings of the University of Albany stand as well. And this is the female Carna blue. And here on, on this picture, uh, you can see the, the orange crescents and only she has it the spring azure and the eastern tail blue that also fly in that same time and our little blue butterflies don't have the crescents and the the color is kind of a dusty blue a brownish blue not the bright blue of the males and here's a picture of the carna blues puddling and we just want to take a moment to notice all the rare and beautiful species of the Albany pine bush. This a final picture of the Albany pine bush, about 2,300 acres. They're hoping to, to get the surrounding areas to bring it up to about 5,000 acres. Last but not least, I wrote a poem about the Albany pine bush, the elusive Carna blue. On Albany dunes, found in the pine bush, protected on the preserve, there's a butterfly so bright blue, it should be an easy one to find. I'm walking with you to find the Carna blue, found on the, over the sands on Albany dunes. My program. Thank you.